All right. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, so this is work that, uh, that I've done with my uh, great students, uh, Vikram Mohenti, David Thames, and Sneha Mehta. Uh, so as you see from the title, this paper is about identifying people in historical photographs. Um, why do we want to do this? Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a problem domain that uh, IUI has, has spent a lot of time thinking about necessarily. So I want to explain some motivations why this might be something of interest for us. Um, so there's a variety of reasons. Um, one motivation is to correct the historical record. Uh, in this example here, um, an author wrote a book about this famous portrait of U.S. Marines uh, storming Iwo Jima, and through a uh, process of photo identification, uh, came to realize that one of these men was actually not his father, as he previously believed was the case. Another motivation is creating economic value. Um, not everybody is quite this lucky, but in this example, somebody uh, came across a photo of uh, the famous outlaw Billy the Kid uh, and purchased it at a flea market for, I think, five or ten dollars. Uh, yeah, ten dollars, and it turned out to be worth millions. Uh, so it can generate value. Another motivation, helping us to recognize the contributions made by people in marginalized groups. There's a really fun story um, pretty recently about this photo um, that was kind of being spread around social media, a photograph of a biologist at a conference in the 70s. And one of the attendees in the photo is an African-American woman and, and was unnamed in the caption. So uh, through social media, the, the question was asked, who is this person? And eventually, we were able to get the name um, of, this, of this individual who made this contribution uh, to this conference a long time ago. Um, a final motivation for doing this kind of thing is thinking about the personal connections that people can make. Um, there's plenty of stories like this, but just one nice example here. Um, this woman is talking about this portrait of her um, Civil War ancestor. And uh, she says that this portrait has changed my whole life. It's given me a passion to learn more about this person and her family history. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into what it means to do historical portrait identification in a particular context and some of the challenges that are involved there. Um, and then I'm going to demo a system that we created called Civil War Photo Sleuth that helps with these identifications and talk about our evaluation of the system during its first month uh, out in the wild and some broader takeaways. So of course, there's many different kinds of historical fo photos that we could try to identify. Um, for this project, we narrowed down our context a little bit more uh, to photos from the American Civil War era, which was the uh, 1860s. And why the Civil War? It was a really interesting time for photography. The American Civil War was the first widely photographed uh, conflict. And so just as these uh, photographs are becoming cheap enough that just about anybody can afford to get one, uh, these soldiers are going off to war, and they want to leave photos behind for their families. And then, of course, the families want to have images of their, of their loved ones. So these almost became the social media of the day. Um, people would buy them and sell them and trade them. Uh, as this famous quote notes, they're sort of the social currency of the day. And uh, people really treated them, uh, took them seriously. They were a really important part of their lives. So fast forward 150 years later, um, by one estimate, there's still over four million of these photographs around today, just photographing soldiers from one side of the conflict, the Union Army, possibly many more. Uh, however, only 10 or 20 percent of those are identified. Nobody bothered to write the names down on the backs of most of these because they knew who they were. It wasn't important at the time. But today, we're left wondering who these folks are and trying to attach a name to a, to a face. And there's lots of different folks, for some of those reasons I mentioned earlier, motivated to do this. Um, historians, genealogists, people in uh, libraries and archives, and of course, antiques collectors and dealers are all trying to figure out who these people are. So what does this process look like for a um, uh, Civil War photo sleuth? What do they do? So take a photo like this um, that we're trying to identify. And this is a pretty easy example because this is a uh, fairly high-ranking soldier. But maybe we want to identify this, this gentleman in the middle. Uh, it's going to be also a little bit easier because he's a little more distinctive than um, your typical soldier. Well, first we're going to look for some visual clues beyond his face. And um, the Civil War photo sleuth is going to notice that he has a distinctive uniform. 
It's going to match up with a frock coat that a soldier holding the rank of brigadier general would wear. He's also holding a, a, his hat, and his hat is also a distinctive kind of hat with a particular hat cord that, again, identifies his rank insignia. So now that we know um, this guy's rank, we can go and full, pull out some um, reference materials to try to figure out who he is. And it turns out that there's uh, quite a few books that have been published on Civil War generals with photos inside of them. And if we just go through one of these books, we find that there's actually 580 different generals just to figure out who this one particular guy is. So you might page through all 583 of those pages and you, and you realize, well, he's not in there. I don't think he's in there. So then you realize that he might be actually wearing an honorary rank insignia and that if that's the case, he would be ending up in this other book that has 1,400 more generals where are holding the honorary rank. And so you might have to page through every one of those and hopefully you're not tired and missing it um, or um, you blink and, and you lose it. But if you did that, you'd eventually find a match uh, or somebody that looks pretty close to this guy. And again, he's pretty unique looking, so that kind of helps. And then the last thing that this photo sleuth is going to do is kind of try to weigh the evidence on all the other contexts that might help decide if this is indeed the same person, George Rutherford. Uh, so there's a back to the photograph, and there's some information about who took the photo and where it was taken. In this case, it's in Washington, D.C. Uh, so we might decide to figure out if this soldier actually um, lived or, or served in the Washington, D.C. area. This uh, little stamp down here was a tax stamp from a particular era uh, from 1864 to 66, so we might ask, does this make sense? Did the soldier serve in this rank during this time period? And then we might look for additional photographs of this soldier. Now that we have a name, we can look at that name and see if we can find more photos, and that might either narrow it down or rule it out. So there's clearly a lot of different challenges here uh, at different stages of the process. What we wanted to do was try to support it by creating a, um, a website that combines crowdsourcing and face recognition technology. Uh, so on this site, there's a, a bunch of different things you can do. I'll show a video very shortly about how we identify photos. Uh, that's sort of our bread and butter. But you can also just search the site for names of relatives or uh, people from a particular state. Or you could just add photographs if you want to help increase the reference database. Uh, so initially, we seeded the site with over uh, 17,000 identified photographs of Civil War soldiers. Uh, mostly from, from public collections, but a, f a few private ones as well. So here's the workflow of somebody using this site to try to identify an unknown uh, soldier portrait. Uh, first, they're going to come to this dashboard. These are pictures that have maybe been added by other users as well as, as your own pictures. Um, on the Add Photo page, you're going to, of course, select the photo of the unknown soldier that you're trying to identify. And that will get uploaded. And if a face is detected, on this next screen, uh, you'll be asked to provide some visual tags. And so these visual tags are serving a couple of different roles. Um, the first thing that you're doing is you're indicating what is the format of this photo, what rank insignia might be visible, and those tags may be valuable for other folks to be searching for photographs later on down the road. So this person is marked an eagle as the shoulder strap rank insignia. If you're not a Civil War military expert, you might not know that that eagle corresponds to the rank of colonel. So on this interface here, those visual clues are being mapped onto um, a particular search filter that's linked to that soldier's military records. So what this means is if, if you're looking at this soldier with these eagle straps and he held this rank of colonel, then we only want to see search results of soldiers who at some point in the war held that rank of colonel, including promotions and demotions. And because we have the complete military records for that soldier, um, for all the soldiers that are identified, we can um, uh, account for those promotions and demotions. So finally, we're going to see search results. And there's a few things going on here. So first of all, we've ruled out any soldiers who weren't colonels. And then we're using face recognition to sort the results. So anyone that doesn't cross a particular particular threshold of similarity is not going to even be shown here. But for those who do qualify, they're going to be sorted by facial similarity. If you find a potential match like this guy, um, you can zoom in and out, use this comparison view to get kind of a detailed understanding of how um, likely they are 
to be the same person. There's some surrounding context here, so we can consider their military records. Does this make sense, given all that we know about this unknown photograph? If they are the same, you click this Identify button, um, and you've proposed this match, and those photos will be linked. Somebody else can come along later and suggest a different identification. Um, and so uh, this sort of in a wiki style uh, debate about who it actually is. So um, broadening this concept a little bit, we're obviously looking at this as a um, needle in a haystack problem. So to solve that, we have this three-stage sort of haystack solution model for person identification. So the first uh, goal here is to build the haystack and get as many people as possible in this identified database. And so when you add a photo to this um, site, either an unknown photo or a known one, that increases that haystack. The second step is trying to narrow down the haystack. So now we have all these possible identified photographs. Um, let's use these visual tags. Let's use the search filters and let's use the um, facial recognition to try to thin down the haystack to the most likely pieces of hay. And then finally we have this comparison view that allows us to find that needle by doing these kind of close inspections of the last mile. Uh, something else that we um, realized we had to do very early on was uh, to try to get as many volunteer users as possible. People bringing in this enthusiasm for these photos but also their expertise. Uh, so we did a few different things to try to get this critical mass. First, um, we advertised and went to existing online communities and social media where people do this sort of identification all the time. And it turns out there's quite a few Facebook groups. Um, this group, Military Images, has over 100,000 uh, Facebook followers. So there's people that are really excited about this and we went to where they were. Um, we also held some in-person events. We would go to Civil War collectible shows where people had these photographs there in display cases and have them bring them over to our site and add them to the site and see what they could find. Um, get identifications on the spot if possible. We did a launch at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. And um, that was a pretty central location for people to show up. And then finally, we tried to get the word out through, through media coverage. And we just talked to pretty much anybody that was willing to ask us to do an interview to get the word out and hopefully get as many people aware of the project as possible. Um, so this site was launched back in, in, in August. And our analysis for this paper was looking at the first month of usage. What did people actually do on this site? And so we looked at their log data of people using the site. We did interviews with nine of the most active users. And we did a manual inspection of the uh, photos that were proposed as identifications. And so. Um, for each of these possible matches, we had a rating between one and four. And we consider the first two ratings to be a negative match, probably not the right person, and um, the latter two being a positive match. So uh, a decent chance of being the correct ident identification. So what do people do? Well, they added photos. Um, in that first month, we had over 600 registered users. They added over 2,000 photos. Um, and we actually had a few power users who added quite a bit more uh, than the average. People talked about why they did or didn't do this. Um, they were excited to help other people out. Some people didn't want to add photos, though. They were afraid of um, possibly uh, um, making it easier for bootleggers to copy these, these photographs and sell them. Getting to the heart of the question, how did it help people with identifications? Uh, so we saw 500 photographs that were uploaded um, and eventually identified. Most of those were what we call pre-identified. People already knew who they were. But 119 of those photos were new identifications that resulted from our system. And those are the ones we kind of zoomed in on. Uh, so we split this up into four categories. Is this a photo that's being matched to an identical copy or view of that photo or a different view of the same soldier? And then on the other dimension, is this a photo that already had an inscription or is this an unnamed, unknown photograph? So the easiest ones, not surprisingly, um, were uh, the ones that had an inscription and were matched to the same view. And we found that there were um, 17 successful uh, positive matches out of 17. The second group, a little bit harder, but still not too bad. We also saw um, essentially 100% positive matches. And the hardest group are those photos where we're trying to match a different photo of that person without an inscription. 
And here, we're still seeing a pretty good success rate, but we're starting to see some false positives, where only um, 25 of the 37 were positive matches. We have some fun quotes here, people talking about how they were able to hit um, uh, a match pretty soon in this process, or maybe seven, 10 or 15% of the total number of photos that they added had some kind of positive match that uh, they were pretty excited about. And so finally, there were some interesting comments about how people um, compared the uh, face recognition technology with their own um, abilities as Civil War photo sleuths. And one thing that we noted pretty quickly from these interviews is that the face recognition was powerful, but certainly not perfect. So when we look at those 119 new identifications, there were 19 where the match of the correct identification was somewhere between number two and number 50 in the search, in the, um, in the facial similarity results. And there were 11 where actually the correct match was past number 50, uh, somewhere beyond there even. So what's going on here? Um, the users talked about what they saw as possible complementary strengths. Humans are good at looking at things like the ears, um, different nose shapes, um, different hairstyles and facial hairstyles that the face recognition isn't accounting for. Face recognition also struggle with things like side or profile views that are not very common today, but were pretty stylish back in the, in the 1860s. And then, of course, the AI is not going to get tired. The AI is not going to fatigue. Uh, so the humans realized that um, they were sort of, um, they had a possible weakness there. Some of them still thought they would do better than the AI. Um, and and it's, the point is just that they're, they, they realized that they would experience some fatigue. Uh, so just wrapping up a couple of fun success stories. Uh, we were able to identify a photo in the Library of Congress collection using Civil War Photo Sleuth uh, to this match here. And this is now listed as being identified through our site. Also, uh, identifications in private collections. This was a particularly fun example because this soldier matched a New Hampshire back mark to a soldier who fought in a New York regiment, which didn't initially make sense until this user did a little extra background research and realized that this soldier actually was from New Hampshire, um, but he ended up signing up to fight in a different military unit. So the current status of the site is we have over 10,000 uh, registered users. Uh, these are all, of course, volunteers that are using the site because they are, I guess, excited about it. Uh, they've added almost 10,000 additional photos beyond that initial C group that we had for a total of about over 26,000. So just some broader takeaways here. Um, one thing we're trying to do with this site is to foster original research, research and um, try to prevent people from creating misinformation. So when we ask people to tag these images, their visual clues are separated from the interpretations of what those clues actually mean. People might disagree about what they mean, but they're probably not going to disagree about the presence of the visual clues themselves as much. Um, number two, we want to create the sustainable model for contributions. So whether you're adding a new photograph that's um, uh, not identified and you're trying to solve that mystery, or you just want to enrich the database by adding known photographs, it's the same process. Uh, so people's incentives to contribute are aligned with the value that they're hopefully getting out of that system. And then finally, um, we're trying to leverage these complementary strengths that I mentioned earlier between this crowd and the face recognition. Um, clearly, neither of these groups is ideally suited for solving this task on their own, but together um, they're able to complement and, and uh, balance each other's strengths to hopefully re result in a better outcome than either alone. Uh, so with that, I will um, say thanks for listening. And I want to thank also my co-authors and um, the great team that worked with us as well as our funding. I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, so are there any questions? No questions. So I have one. All right. A bit uh, different one, I guess. You noted at the very beginning that these are all Union soldiers. What happened to the Confederates? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, the estimate of 4 million surviving photos is an estimate um, just based on, on Union photographs. We don't have a good estimate for how many Confederate images survive. Um, one of the reasons being there's a lot fewer Confederate images because there was a blockade during the Civil War 
and a lot of the chemicals for making photographs never really made it to the south. Uh, so nobody has made that estimate of how many Confederate images survive. In our database, we also have a bias um, in which most of the photographs are Union soldiers. Um, part of the reason is that a lot of our images come from public databases that were maintained by the federal government, which was not surprisingly a lot more interested in capturing these images of Union soldiers after the war. Um, but in terms of what our users are contributing, we're seeing a lot more um, diversity of the kinds of images that come in from the community. So more Confederate images, more African-American soldiers, um, more civilians and, and female images as well. Um, I was just curious about, uh, have you had a chance to test for the robustness of the system? Because there's a lot of dependence on human collaborators and the information that they provide. So if they choose to provide not so correct information just to have fun, so right. <laughs> like how would that, I understand that you do a lot of fact checking, sure. but there's, because I see a lot of, there's, there's a huge component of human uh, influencing the whole uh, system. So uh, like what are your views on that? Right, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So I guess there's, there's two answers. Um, one is that of course, some of these users are doing original research. So they're identifying photos that haven't necessarily been identified before in the past. And that's a little bit harder to um, measure baselines for. And that's why we use this, this expert review technique where we kind of go through each one manually and, and weigh the evidence and try to reach a conclusion. Um, informally, we've also done some um, testing with images that have known identifications to try to get a sense for, um, you know, how, how well is the AI doing on its own? Or how well does a typical user perform on their own? Uh, we don't report those, those uh, results, though, in this paper. Um, it's something we're pretty interested in for follow-up work. Hi, uh, Casey Dugan from IBM Research. So you talked a little bit about if the humans were disagreeing, you might solve it wiki style, or they kind right. of fight it out. I, have you done analysis on that? Have you thought about using AI in that process? Yeah, that's, that's one of the most interesting things, I think, that, um, that we're starting to see on the site, where we have more than one proposed identification uh, for a soldier. And, and sometimes, for especially um, exciting identifications, these things can get pretty heated, right? If someone thinks they have a, you know, a new General Grant or a new Abraham Lincoln or something like that, then, well, we know from the Billy the Kid example, that could be worth millions. And so there's a lot of interesting debate um, that, that can arise there. We haven't had enough um, examples of those debates to really do a, a robust analysis. Um, we're hoping now that our, usage, uh, our user base has grown a lot, that we're going to see a lot more of those. And maybe we can do um, a more thorough investigation of what's going on there. Um, it's a kind of an interesting open question of what to do when we support original research like this. Uh, Wikipedia famously has a policy where it doesn't allow original research. So they don't necessarily have the same kinds of conflicts as we do here when there's not necessarily a clear ground truth. Um, but again, it's something I'm really excited to, to uh, follow up on with some more analysis. Any more questions? Um, thank you for your talk, very interesting. So um, for future work, uh, I was wondering, can this be applied to other problems other than photo identif identification. So maybe uh, text authorship uh, identification or something. Yeah, great question. I think there's a, maybe a, a lot of different directions we could go from here. Um, to be honest, we have mostly been focusing on person identification. Um, you know, more locally, there's different historical periods we might consider beyond the American Civil War for, for photo identification. Um, a little more broadly, we're also thinking about, you know, possible applications to modern person identification tasks, you know, helping to find missing persons and things like that. Um, the slightly uh, further out for, for future work that we're thinking about, I think I have a slide here, is um, related to um, location identification. Where's my mouse? Oh, here it is. Um, so 
uh, just as people are trying to identify uh, the names of individuals, they're also interested in figuring out where photos were created, and especially in historical periods, and trying to piece together information from lots of different locations. So in some future work, we're thinking about bringing these ideas from person identification to um, location identification, image geolocation. OK, I guess it's time to thank our speaker again and to move on. Yeah, our next